sorry, Clay could not pick up his phone. is the Jake Feinberg Show. Comedy on Power Talk, thank you so much for making us part of your day today. And um, I was probably seeing my guest once or twice a month for almost two years on the bandstand, and he was uh, invigorating uh, myself and many other people um, just by his true nature and his... Uh, his ability, and I think maybe just the idea that he was like growing as a musician on the bandstand uh, in that time, and I can't imagine what it would have been like to see other cats, if I was born at a different time, uh, grow as musicians, uh, not just facility and chops, but really just knowing what notes to play, when not to play, and obviously doing it with uh, a cadre of really amazingly classic individuals, West Coast cats that are very different than the East Coast. I mean, it's it's uh, there's a noticeable discernment. Uh, they're always about five or ten minutes late for radio interviews as well. It's just a very laid, <laughs> laid back situation. But um, regardless of that, um, it's been a, a long journey and i think i'm just hoping and praying that sooner than later we will see a recognizable touring circuit uh crop up again um within the united states so that i can heal again because of my guest playing and his just a uh, classic nature uh, what an honor clay finch welcome back to the jake feinberg show so it's great to be here, Jake. Thank you, brother. Um, how's how the how are the waves? How are the you been catching the waves these days? How, how's the surf? I'm I'm driving to the beach right now. Ah, I love it. I mean, it has. Can you talk about like what has been like physically or? or psychologically what has been hard the hardest part of this um you know this prolonged absence of being able to consistently play live to people um well you know actually we got to play a show last weekend we were up in the central coast with Dan Horn and um, it actually, to me, it seemed like I didn't realize how much I missed it until I got to do it again. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Everything has just been so upside down the last year and a half anyway that um, it wasn't, I mean, it, it was a little bit harder to put my finger on. It wasn't so much like I would wake up in the morning and say like, oh man, I haven't played in front of an audience for, you know, three and a half months, what am I going to do? I mean, but that was obviously, you know, something that was affecting me, but it was more noticeable when I got to do it again. And I was like, wow, that's how it feels. And that's, uh, yeah, it was just really 
special. What what um would you say that like uh I mean for me um if I was a musician, I mean if somebody took the microphone away from me for a year, it would be um difficult because it allows me to keep connecting um to humanity and can you talk about the feelings that you had when you got on the bandstand? I know it was like a three was it like a three night run with the Dan Horn band. Yeah, it was it's totally like uh what you were saying about something, you know, a fogginess or it's like it's like when you go on the road and you only eat cheeseburgers and drink beer for like two weeks and but you just kind of get into a rhythm and you don't realize you're just turning into a total dirt bag <laughs> then you you get somewhere where there's a whole foods or something and then you get like a salad and a, a juice and something and all of a sudden you're like holy moly i didn't know how much i needed to eat something green <laughs> um, i dig man i totally did or you know it's like uh just sitting on your butt for a couple of weeks and then finally doing something that makes you break a sweat and you're like, holy shit, how have I been, how have I just been doing this? Whole, how's my brain been working this whole time while I just haven't gotten any exercise or, you know, it was, you know, you can slip into a rhythm and not really realize what's happening until you fix it. And that's what it was like. It was like not having any green vegetables for a couple of weeks and then eating some, you feel really good. What was the, um, you know, can you talk, I mean, as best you can, I mean, was there, was there a, like a, a, how big was the audience at those shows? Like how close could, I mean, these are things that I'm, I'm obviously very selfish about having to be close to the stage and, <laughs> you know, dance and getting off and, and like, you know, I mean, people put a spit, spit, gear around my head or you know put a bubble suit around me but, <laughs> but like really i mean it, it must be it's kind of like i would say it would be kind of mysterious in these early days uh what was the crowd what was that whole thing what was it like i mean did it really feel like a real show yeah i mean certainly i don't think you can compare it to like you know playing a pack go at the Brooklyn Bowl or something where everyone's just like sweating all over each other and squeezed in that's you know that's a pretty unique energy um the shows were still at a fairly limited capacity and they wanted to keep people kind of spaced out from each other right so um, I mean, they would have been dragging me out of the venue, I think. Dude. <laughs> I mean, we're, I guess that's the point. I recognize that people like within the like the fans need to keep social distance. But like, can can they get close to the stage? I, I know you guys were allowed to sing or at least, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so like people are, you know, like how close can cats even get to the stage at this point? I'm just curious. Um, I think it's, a, I think it was sort of like six feet was the idea. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you know, once everything actually starts to happen, you know, right. the, you know, the principle of, you know, what the goal that's trying to be accomplished, keeping everybody safe is noble and I'm 110% down with it. But also once everyone, you know, the rules are they become slightly arbitrary. It's like, oh, you don't have to wear a mask if you're eating, but you do when you're not eating. Or I agree, you know, you, I totally, totally, dude, totally. Yeah. You know, I I think it's everyone needs to still be really careful. And but you know, it's so everything. Once you start playing for about an hour, um, I don't know. Yeah, you know, everybody kept their distance, and you could get about six feet from the stage. But um, really, what I think is interesting is uh i mean i'm sure it'll be different to play a big show in you know six months or whatever when you have a bunch of people in there but i also felt like um what was pretty cool is everybody at the shows it, they were just so excited to um oh. be there and you know there was like a lot of gratitude and like real sincere you know 
like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy to see live music. And, um, and it was, you know, from the get go before, you know, we played or people danced or anything, we were also feeling the same way. It's like so good to be playing music. Um, and so once I feel like everybody's energy was sort of heightened, even though you didn't have as many people, it almost kind of didn't matter because everybody was just so fired up to be either, you know, watching music or listening or playing or, you know, the whole interaction that goes on between the audience and the band and stuff. So great. Um, so it great. Really power. Oh, it's just uh, it's so great. And then, I mean, can you talk about like, this is a very mysterious, uh, I mean, this project, where, what do you feel your role is? I mean, you're, uh, I mean, horn is playing lead guitar sometimes. Uh, what, 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 um, can you talk a little bit about this band? Super fun. It's um, it's pretty loose, and um, it's you know it has kind of like a just thrown together group of buddies vibe, which is kind of my favorite. And you know it's obviously centered around Dan's songs and. Um, you know, his, he's kind of uh, guiding the master. He's sort of in control. But we all sing a couple of our own songs, and we all kind of switch around instruments. Um, so it's it's really fun. It's kind of just like like a jam or something more than, a, you know, like a – it's not very uh, – premeditated right no i mean what, what i mean know, when you totally like, oh we need to have this and that or it's sort of like okay now sam you do your song and they're like okay well that means like omar's gotta play bass okay cool let's do that um but playing with all those guys is really next level i mean they're all everyone in that band is i'm just like trying to keep up well and, it's always i mean it's always um, important to play with people that are better than you or, you know, I mean, that is how you get, yeah. I mean, what are you, when you say multi, like what, besides guitar, what instruments will you switch on to? Like congas or what will you play? Yeah. Yeah. I, was, I got a, I got to hit, hit the percussion stage. I love it, dude. I, I mean, this is, yeah, a, this is the greatest better. band in the world, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you know, Clay, uh, we, uh, we have a game on this program called, uh, name that voice and uh, I want you to take a listen to this uh, and pay attention to the content and then we'll come back and break it down alright while I was surfing a little while ago I just I was thinking about this I was thinking about how songwriting is constantly gnawing at me the idea of writing songs and the need to write what I feel are good songs gnaws at me stronger than almost anything else in life. You know, I have no children, so I thought about it. I, I thought, oh, you know, does the idea of, like, having a family gnaw at me as hard as this? No, it doesn't, actually. Like, other things fade into the background. Um, when, I, when I'm really honest with myself, like, writing songs, playing music, singing... Singing definitely, um, you know, factors in for me, too. Um, there is a true need to do it. I don't know if I would fucking die if I didn't. I might not die. You know, I might have to figure something else out um, because, you know, living life is a beautiful thing. So um, I don't want to think that I'd have to die without anything, Um you know, there's infinite ways to live a life, so maybe something else can be figured out. But I'd rather not face that prospect, that's for sure. And it's really frightening to think about a life without being able to play music or sing. Um, I definitely do not want to ever have to answer that question. That Clay Finch, you want to take a guess at who that is? Jesus, is that Neil? Yeah, that was my interview, second interview with Neely, man. And wow. I and that was from 2017, and wow. it kind of st I really am, it's profound. I haven't listened to that audio clip in in quite some time, but it is kind of uh, I don't know what the right word is for it. But I I kind of, that's you know he said I was surfing before we did the interview, and he's like that's why I kind of asked you about the 
the the pause this like can you talk about i mean you 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 were you write a lot of songs you're very comfortable on stage in a lot of different settings and i just wanted you to talk about if you have that gnawing feeling as well about uh about music i mean to me there's this idea that i used to think that cats like yourselves would get on the bandstand and like you know you'd want to reach some state of bliss. But in fact, what I've really come to realize is that you guys play music so that you can stay inspired to live and to breathe. And I just wanted you to reflect on that. I mean, is, is there, because then he talks about, I asked him, I said, if you, if music was taken away from you, would you die Uh, or would your soul die? And he basically said, yeah. you know, there's infinite ways to live. Obviously, we know tragically whatever happened uh, that didn't work out. But from your own perspective, uh, from your own point of view, do you have do you have that 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 feeling inside that that of of creation of song creation, or are you do or do you just follow the muse? Well, man, that's heavy. That's that. That was a trip. Yeah, yeah I know. I'll send you the whole interview. Um, You're going to be loving that interview, dude. Yeah, yeah, wow. Rest in peace, Neely. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, this year has definitely been um, an unparalleled reflection on that. You know, something that we never, something that we took for granted, for sure. Never really having to consider that, um, you know, for a second, you know. God forbid, like something really extreme happened, like you, you know, lose your hands or something. <laughs> right, exactly, um, voice or something like that. Y- yeah, right. Yeah, which I suppose is not that uncommon. Um, I mean, I, I think in some ways this year has been um, really healthy in that reason because we've had everybody has had, you know, as either you know, we were presented with a, with a serious problem, something that we had, you know, an abundance of, uh, you know, the being able to create that experience was totally gone. So we all had to find it in other places and, or maybe we didn't find it in other places and we had to figure that out too. Hmm. Um, but I feel pretty fortunate. I had a couple you know, places I could quickly turn and, um, you know, get that same sort of nourishment, um, being able to be in the ocean, um, is, yeah, kind of maybe the number one thing if I, if I couldn't have, you know, when we didn't have music this last year, um, there's a lot of, I think really interesting parallels between the feelings of playing music and the feeling of being on a wave. Um, and, you know, I was also just really blessed to have family and friends and people in my life that, you know, I can have fulfilling conversations with and, um, you know, just ways to find that same nourishment that music gives you and that that experience that you get when you p- play music for a bunch of people and that communication between the audience and the band. and um, It's pretty hard to, you know, recreate. And I don't think that's necessarily the, I don't know, it's tough. But I think this year definitely. I mean, it was just, it's a trip to hear Neil's answer to that question. I I, so, I still can't believe so wild. it's. I mean, so let me ask you something. Um, <clears throat> this is just so great you brought this up. The idea is that um, musically, like you said, the 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 correlation between playing music or being on like a when you guys are all locked in and then and riding a wave. Um, so this would sort of be the equivalent of like, 
for this past year, there was no swell in the ocean or there was too much wind in the ocean <laughs> musically right yeah and and, and that, yeah, exactly. that, by the way i learned that from a legendary ben knight by the way who talked he he was talking to me about how he and neely got when when neil moved to ventura they would go surfing but if if there was no swell or too much wind then they would go record shopping so that's where i got uh-huh. that you know but <laughs> i mean like did do you feel looking back on it i mean just in the in the myriad of projects that you're in mapache which is your band with Sam Blasucci or Grateful Shred or, you know, even the Dan Horn band or anything else. I mean, to me, like, I always felt like you guys, you, you in particular, it was really about a community. It was about fun. It was about having fun. I mean, at the end of the day, nobody's really getting rich being a road dog. You're doing it for peace. You're doing it because you love what you do. And do you feel like, and I know that there are a lot of people in music who get a lot of accolades, stardom, uh, and it goes to their head. And so their ego is very invested in this idea of touring, playing lots of shows, having a certain pedigree, staying in nice places, and then being adulated by the crowd. And so like that part of it, that sort of ego-driven thing, to me, that would be difficult. Do you feel like your point of view, if that's accurate, where you just kind of are doing this, I don't want to say as a public service, but you're really doing it to uplift other people, <laughs> that that aided you in getting through this time. Because let's face it, we all had a failure of imagination. I saw you guys in Fernwood in February rocking out on a, on a sweaty dance floor. It was such a great hang. Went down to the fire pit. We had a, you know, we, we built a fire. And I just assumed I'd see you in, in April or something. And never in my yeah. wildest dreams could I have ever imagined something like this happening. So I do feel like your whole point of why you do music to begin with has given you some, well, the way you're talking about it is it doesn't seem like it's been uh, an overly agonizing experience, which is a great thing. And I just wonder if you think that that's a fair thing, like your ego was never, uh, you were able to manage it even before you know, this, this pause? Um, uh, well, there's a, you just, there's a lot of stuff there. That's, yeah, that's, it just, it just go wherever you want to <laughs> go, go over. You don't have to answer the yeah. question. Just go off where you yeah. want to go. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, certainly this year I've reflected on, um, how, how lucky I am to, you know, some, some people have music and that's, that's it. And, um, and you know, there's nothing right or wrong with that. And, and in a lot of ways, probably really special because it makes it, you know, incredibly powerful. It's like, it's the only thing, um, you know, like I, sometimes I think about the like classic, kind of rock and roll god icon people that we think of that sort of just like gave it all up just for music like you know no fam no real family life nothing no, no, like, totally. you know, real which is you know in some ways a little tragic but in some ways you know really beautiful to just that's how you get some of that music it seems like sort of the only way you know if, if that's all you have uh but you know for you know, for better or for worse or whatnot, that, that's not how it is for me. And I guess I felt lucky to have that, you know, when, when it was taken away from me, you know, it made things really different and definitely challenging, but it wasn't, you know, the end all be all. You just had to find that, you know, sense of connection and sense of, you know, spirit and and sense of fun and yeah. sense of adventure mm. and uh, and other things. And you know, I was fortunate enough to have a couple of those. Uh, yeah. I mean, you talk about uh, a couple times. I've been doing a couple of interviews with with Ben Knight, and he said that you were in on a couple of projects with him. Is that is that true? You were doing a soundtrack or? 
Um, yeah. You know, I'm saying like, like that's the kind, I mean, can you just talk about how the community, it's a very special community. I'm actually, I feel more connected to that community than even, even in some ways my own local community in Tucson, although there's beautiful people here. I just wonder about, you know, if you guys sort of made an unconscious decision to um, pick each other up too. Um, uh, it, you know, even if somebody wasn't feeling down, it was just the idea of creating. I, I just feel like that's always the most important thing is like, it doesn't matter what, you know, how many toys you have. It doesn't matter how much fame or, or, you know, I think to me, it's about creating and hoping that through that creation, um, obviously you inspire yourself, but that other people can feel inspired too, that your light and your, um, and your kindness inspires other people to have faith, you know, and not, and not check out. And I just wanted you to talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the general music community that you are in and how everybody, or maybe hasn't, you know, everybody, you know, McCutcheon's on the tennis courts with Richard Gowan, you know, I mean, everyone has their own yeah. thing going on, but like, you know, I feel like you guys are like a baseball team and you got to pick each other up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think about it all the time, how crazy it is, how it all just came together like that, you know, like 10 years ago, I didn't have that community and now I do. And it's just so unreal. It's just like, constantly uh kind of aghast at how lucky i got how it, how sweet it just all came together with all those dudes there's, there's just so many super 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 special people um yeah and and we you know we sort of just figured out that playing and working together and you know, having fun together. It it wasn't like something that needed to be, you know, like, hey, we need to get together so we can work on this. It was sort of like we'd been doing stuff together that was much fun and seemed like it worked really well. It's like, uh, it's like if we figured out that we could make a really good dinner together and we'd been making dinners for a long time. It wasn't like... <laughs> Yeah, gumbo. It, it, yeah. it never stopped. Yeah, we just like kept kept going, even though you know there was a pandemic and all the live shows were shut down and stuff. We still had to. We still. It wasn't out of some. I mean, maybe it was um, unconsciously or something, but it it wasn't some sort of like prescribed thing. Like you know, if we don't do this, then we're gonna fall apart or maybe it was but for me it's just it's sort of like you guys want to guys want to do dinner again that was you know that was really fun the last time we did it let's do it again and right. so we just sort of kept it going um and yeah we've been lucky enough to have that community and be you know keep that going a lot of people haven't haven't had that yeah being able to play music and um, be in community with those guys is super, super special. I mean, can you talk about, like, um, have you been directly impacted at all by the pandemic? I mean, uh, I feel like we've lost, I mean, I, I just in the last few weeks, we've, we've lost some, a lot of musicians, uh, older cats, yeah. you know, really Titanic guys I've interviewed. I mean, uh, and it just seems like uh, my hope, Clay, is that, you know, and I, I, I still I just feel like if I can just be a conduit for it. I mean, I I do I do feel like my hope is that it's not just that people are excited to see the shows and that there's giddiness and great energy and the shows are have a have a great vibe. That's obviously paramount. But. You know, the significance of music in our society, especially in the West, has changed so much. At, at one time, you know, uh, it dictated culture. And 
you know, for a variety of reasons, it doesn't always do that anymore. And I really am, it's amazing to me and that it's the one industry that has not uh, fully come back, really come back at all uh, since the pandemic started. And, um, you know, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is like, um, what do you, what have you, is, is there, is there something like that you have, um, fundamentally thought about that, you know, you know, not just the idea of playing, but like, you know, that because of, because of the pandemic, you've, um, had more gratitude or maybe you're, you, you're going to bring some, something different to the bandstand or maybe some more, or is there something like, you know, within your constitution that, that you're like, you know, I am never going to, I'm going to do this now from now on, uh, or because I took this for granted before. Um, is there anything like, I mean, how have you changed? Do you feel as a person through this time? Oh, I mean, it's, it's night and day, you know, it's never going to be the same. I mean, when we were on the road the other weekend with Dan, it was like, it was so much fun to just be in a weird gas station. With all <laughs> your buddies. Dude, like, I love it. Like man. that. Yeah, no, totally. That, like, you know, just, uh, just the adventure of touring, you know, like trying to take a nap in like an uncomfortable seat in a car and someone's playing West African music in the front seat and you're just like bouncing along in the middle of nowhere. It's the best. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's such a good little adventure. Lagos, um, the unbelievable rhythms there. You can't really sleep, but you know, you're, but you miss that. You realize you're like <laughs> the stuff that used to set you off when you did it consistently. That's the stuff you miss the most, right? Yeah, totally. Wow. And then, you know, th- those are just the tiny little simple things. You know, of course, when uh, people are, are just going to, be in tears when we can all be together in full capacity with no restraints or no wonderings about whether or not this is a good idea or whether or not this is safe or you know when we can all be in a stinky little club and i can give you a big hug and you know we can play music really loud and sweat on each other everyone's just it's gonna be <laughs> it's at me too i don't know experience. what's gonna go if down it wasn't before you know, just all the little things, all the like, you know, because traveling and playing music is, you know, it's an an adventure and it's so much fun. But it's also, you know, it can be a little exhausting. So there's always going to be, you know, some moments of a little burnout, you know, especially if you're in, it's an off night and you're in kind of a funky little town and the venue's kind of weird and the sound guy's being a dick and, uh, you know, it's, Sometimes you can slip into like, ah, oh, what the fuck am I doing? Like, this is a burnout. But, you know, I, those kind of thoughts are, are going to just be so different forever now that we had, you know, any sort of opportunity to play music taken away. It's just, you know, we would pay to play at some horrible little club in the middle of nowhere on a Tuesday night for four people. You know, everyone would just, and I think a lot, most people feel that way, which is pretty incredible because I think most people felt, you know, total opposite. Um, it's the, the, I think we're, I think the next year and the next five years, I think we're on the verge of a really, really special time. I love that you it's say, I think, I, you know, I tell me a little bit about, I mean, none of us are prophets, but in what, what do you feel for in it? What do you, what are you feeling? I mean, it, you know, it sounds a little, um, maybe grandiose or something. No, this is the Jake Feinberg. Me, I'm just, feeling the same way. <laughs> it just makes total sense that, you know, every kind of gilded, great, you know, um, hollowed, uh, era of humanity is, um, you know, come after a really horrible thing, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the roaring twenties and the enlightenment and the post-war era and, you know, every sort of, um, really special, you know, all, all these great times in history, it just sort of feels like we might, it would make a lot of sense if that's what happened in the next 
couple of years I, for so many reasons, you know, people are the, the shift and the way we look at things is just going to be, it's going to be so different. Um, you know, just all the little things that will be, that just went taken for granted. How, how, I mean, this is more like a philosophical question, more less than music, but like how, what would you say to people? And I'm sure you encounter them that you have on in your, in your travels. But I mean, the level of <clears throat> rage and anger is like, is out of, it's not just like it's, it, it, it's preventing a potential enlightenment period. I mean, this morning a guy drove into the, I don't know if you saw that the guy kill the police officer yeah. okay it's like yeah like an hour ago uh, yeah it's like yeah. It, it, we have fences around judicial buildings things are so amplified and yeah. so charged up i what would be i mean i think we are spiritually connected because of kindness and because we just want to elevate basically and make other people feel good because that's what our purpose in life is to a degree uh doing it yeah. through our, our own craft but it's like what I, I feel you're I, I I feel like sometimes what you just said before about t the turning point after a really really tough time it the prevent what's preventing it is <clears throat> um well greed and then disinformation but then just anger and rage and I just wonder how you would disarm people um not that it's your job to do that but you know, to change, like, how would you, what would you say to people who are just so, they're, they're hard, you know, they're just filled with darkness. I think that that's probably surfing for you clear, in a lot of ways clears out the dark corners of your heart. We all need to clear out those corners once in a while. But for those that yeah. are really dark, I mean, being that you've been on the sidelines and been unable to basically practice your yoga craft for a year and you're in this kind of you know, you're not whining, there's no self-pity, there's no grievance, there's no blaming, there's no conspiracies. It's just, well, I've learned a couple of things here. I've picked up this, the community's picked me up, I have family. There's gratitude. How, what would you talk to people about, about opening their hearts? Because I think that that will be, there's a large enough minority of people who, because they're in darkness, are preventing the rest of us from actually really moving into a a more positive time. What would you say to those people about opening their hearts? That's a tough one. It's really interesting. Go see a Grateful Shred yeah. show. I mean, <laughs> and I mean, you know, beyond, beyond <laughs> yeah. I mean, like the idea is just like, it's like people, it's like just, um, I don't want to sound hokey because it's not just about loving your neighbor or love, but it's like, walking the walk and 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 then not pitying yourself i mean nothing you've said in this interview so far indicates that you feel like you're a victim of the virus or you've you know something so sacred like music has been or live live performing has been taken away it's very in fact it's like it's like a rebirth now you're 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 just you know, you're on, you're in the middle of nowhere and, and, you know, you're, you're enjoying, and it's just like an appreciation. And I realize I don't want to sit here and try to pretend that I can be in everybody's shoes, but it, there's an insanity here, Clay. I, I mean, that has never happened in my lifetime and it's bizarre. Yeah. It's really bizarre. Yeah. And I just wonder what you, uh, because I don't watch, I can't watch a lot of the news, but you, you can't help but avoid what's going on. I just wonder what you would say to those people to bring them closer to to a peaceful resolution as opposed to driving into and killing police officers or storming the Capitol or whatever, you know? Yeah, I think that's a really, really tough problem that, you know, I don't necessarily feel qualified to answer. <laughs> no, you are qualified, I mean, I, man. You're I mean, it's okay. There's I mean, just what is your do you do you agree with what I'm saying or do you think that we can Absolutely. Even, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are, I think you know, we live in a world um that makes it uh very easy to um be sort of blind to yourself and blind to others 
you know, the way that technology has advanced and the way that everyone has been able to isolate themselves, um, you know, despite uh, pandemic isolation, you know, even before that. Right. Um, right. Yeah, totally. You know, I think there's, you know, it's not like I can just tell someone this who's feeling a, a certain way, but I can say for myself, you know, trying to um, unplug and be um, be aware of what's going on, you know, directly around me. It's just really easy to get distracted from. It's easy to not think about what's really going on inside of your heart, and it's easy to not think about what other people are, you know, are feeling. And I, I think, um, I don't know. I it, it's hard to have, you know, to to make some sort of prescription or whatever, um, you know, for, for people who feel a certain way. Cause I, you know, my circumstances have made my, it made it real easy for me to say some of these things and maybe other people who have. No, I, I think that know. that's the point is that, can you talk about in your family who, where you got your wisdom from to be a kind person and to look inside your heart and realize that, you know, there are just certain things that you, you know, certain ceilings you had to push through and break through, but also like, I mean, who is that, who is that person or who are those people in your family that have given you that anchor to be a kind person? Well, I mean, you know, everybody in my family, certainly my dad, he's been someone who's, um, seen a lot of challenges mm -hmm. and has a pretty unshakable foundation um and just you know anytime i've had a problem or uh, a struggle you know he's all gratitude is one thing that he's always uh mm -hmm. sort of you know always reinforced uh not you know losing your perspective um but he's he has an un unbelievable attitude and outlook on life and he's had some uh he's worked really hard and and been dealt some tough cards and um yeah he's definitely someone who i think i've taken a lot from and been lucky to you know have around talking to clay finch here on the jake feinberg show it's uh it's the best we can do during these times um but um you know I, I it's funny I was going through one of my interviews with um with Chuck Rainey and he you know he he's worked with all the great arrangers and producers and music and and he said that kind of revelatory thing where a lot of times those people um and I'm talking like Henry Mancini and uh, Lalo Schifrin and they're very gifted people but a lot of times they would come in uh you know mu musicians would come in for a record date uh they were not necessarily known um the, the 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 studio cats didn't know their their music and a lot of times they'd come in with with vocals or i mean uh lyrics and it was the studio cats that built the songs it wasn't like the you know a lot of my generation even younger we think that all the music that we love um, those, whether it was hit records or, uh, or, you know, uh, radio hits or, you know, the albums that we love that somehow all that stuff was, was there. And then they pressed the record button and then they did a couple of takes and it was done when in fact, a lot of times it was much looser than that, where the artist would come in and the cats around them would build the song. I just yeah. wonder about that philosophy as it relates to to the projects that you're on. I mean, how, I think you like the fact, you just said it before, at least in the live setting where you, you know, kind of throw people together and jam and it's very loose. And a lot of people get really uptight with recording because they want everything to be completely perfect. And But that's not what it's about. It's about if it feels good. So I just wanted you to talk a little bit about in the studio, like, you know, even though you're probably working with with cats that you know it's not like the studio scene of the 70s 
How loose is it with yeah. you? I mean, how much do you just like other people? Because, you know, when you empower other people to tap into their native gifts, then ch- chances are you're going to get a really great song. Yeah. Well, one thing that I've always thought about in relation to um, recording and sort of the vibe in the studio is that a lot of my favorite um a lot of my favorite records and songs and right away they make me think of how sick the vibe must have been uh when you know when the record button was on like i think about like uh david crosby um laughing uh you know if i could only remember my oh my god that song where there's like you know Joni on backup and jerry on pedal steel and you know everybody fucking cool ever is just like all in the room swaying around to this totally magical song and you just think wow what the hell was the vibe like in that room you could probably you know fucking grab it and put it in your pocket and save it for later because it was just so insane so thick and strong um that's like you know, the most extreme version of that. No, well, actually, I, I think I may have talked to you about this before, but one of the reasons <laughs> that it was so, because I've chronicled that session with Crosby himself when I interviewed him and, and <clears throat> his girlfriend that he was going to marry uh, had just died in a horrible car accident. So every That's musician right. was coming down to support him. Uh, right. On top of that, uh, the engineer, Stephen Quinn Barncard, I, I tipped my cap to him because he, he set it up so that there was like very small baffles and everybody could see each other. But there was a, everybody's was in a raw, open hearted wound. It was the community rallying around. That being said, right. it's the most haunting, freaking ridiculous. It doesn't sound sad. The music is just urgent and burning. So, right. I, you, you know, feel you know, it. You know, this is the, this is another thing that I, I, I was transcribed. This, I, I, there's no real question here. It's just this older, uh, engineer, uh, producer, Daniel Moore, uh, who, and there's an album, Delbert and Glenn from 19, Delbert McClinton and Glenn Clark. You have to get this album on clean records. Oh my God, dude, it is emotional. It, it's over the top. And he said, there's not a single lead vocal overdub on that album. The album was wow. done live because we wanted it to be real. We overdubbed a few lead guitar solos. But the yeah. lead vocals were live when we cut the band tracks. That's what I'm talking about. Like, is that something yeah. that is acceptable for Clay Fit? To me, like that, because I'm telling you, that album, even though I'm talking out of context because you don't know it, man, it, I'm crying when I listen to that album. It is so real. Yeah. Do you guys, yeah. do, 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 do you often, do you guys go in and, th- like you and Sam, or just in general, I mean, how do you abide by that philosophy of like, no lead overdubs vocally. I mean, to me, like, I don't know if you get so caught up in the perfection or trying to get things just perfect based on a stopwatch or uh, freaking whatever. It's just like, I can't listen to that. Yeah. that stuff's not listenable. You know, I mean, you, you can riff yeah. on that any way you want. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely our approach. We're not at all from the musical tradition, or at least myself, not even like really the musical ability to make these, you know, perfect, uh, recordings or, you know, flawless vocal takes or, or whatever, but that's not what I want anyway. I think that stuff, that's not the music that I like and that's not the music I want to make. And the music, the music that I like the most is just when it sounds like you recorded a really special moment and it doesn't matter if it's perfect or not. It's just, the the moment that you that you capture you know whether or not like the you know you could you could take a hundred guitar solo takes um but you know for at least my guitar playing if i do five i can get a good one but after about five they're not going to be better they're just going to be different and so it's sort of like what's the point you know you can do only so many takes but for us, it's not about trying to get this, you know. In fact, sometimes it's like, I don't know, if it sounds too clean, it's kind of dorky. Or, I, I completely do. It, it's it's it it's com- just not raw. It's not, it's just not, it doesn't sound human. No. Or it doesn't sound, all the music that I like the, 
you know, we talk about tuning guitars a lot. Um, like, we haven't had guitar tuners for a couple of us at some of these Dan Horn things. Right. And um, Who cares? And, tune, you make, uh, you know, always, tune to your heart, man. Yeah. yeah. We, you know, I always joke, like, oh, yeah, good. Like, no tuners. <laughs> no, dude, that's not a like, joke. That's good, man. Yeah. Authentic sound. <laughs> you and Alan Toussaint uh, would have know, had a ball. Yeah, go ahead. All the, all the baddest, all the sickest, you know, any good recording has something that's out of tune. Like, you know, all the best sounding records. Highway 61 and American Beauty and Exile on Main Street and Loaded mm. and the Brown Band album and like every every one of my favorite you know like recordings that just make you hum they all or all those old soul records and all those you know funny uh, like kind of low budget um, R&B records and all the doo-wop stuff like they're not it's not perfect you know they're not like at you know 440 hertz or whatever you know and that's why it sounds cool it sounds it sounds like humans making music and I don't know it's I fucking love Steely Dan too and like you know perfect music is really badass but I don't have the ability to make that music anyway and uh so the music that is most fun for me and the most meaning for me is just trying to record um a special moment so we just try to create that in the studio and uh yeah we're lucky enough to have a bunch of really special people and we have a good time and uh yeah i'm i'm pretty stoked on everything that we've made so far let me let me read you this and then you can just extrapolate off of it. I mean, this is from John Simon who produced, uh, the Brown album for the band and seals and Crofts and, and Taj Mahal and a a legendary producer. He said in the sixties, it was all about pre-production, not post-production. When we did the band's big pink album, we took every song and said, quote, how can we make the song better? How can we better this section? What's appropriate? How do these instruments fit together? How do the voices fit? We wanted to get it where they could play it great by practicing it over and over and over again. There was n- Then it was time to roll tape. I didn't spend much time in recording studios with bands that didn't have it together. Bands who spent time in front of the microphone wasting other people's money while they practiced. It was all about pre-production versus post-production. And how much, like when you go in, how important it is for the collective unit, maybe you put a lot of time and energy into this, or not, but it's like, you know, if you go in and you, and you know the material and you've, and it's not a formula trip, but everybody's on the same page, then you can kind of, you know, just crank and roll tape, uh, and not obsess. That's the thing that gets weird about it. And I think it just has something to do with, uh, I don't know the way people hear music now or uh, the, the way majority of people hear it is that the post-production sucks all the soul out of a recording it can and i just wonder like how much if you've been in a situation uh in any of your musical experiences like on albums where you've actually just put your foot down and said um this we've gone there's too much post there's too much production going on in this thing like it has we have to let's get back to the way it sounded when we were in the studio yeah, I mean, that's, I, I couldn't agree more. I think absolutely, at least with the kind of music that we want to make, uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be said for, you know, less is more. There's a couple little things that are cool to experiment with, and you can make some really beautiful stuff happen with, you know. Absolutely. Different, you know, outboard gear and, you know, effects. But for the most part, it's a really slippery slope once you get going on it. Um, one, you know, as far as like personal experiences go, uh, one thing that was really meaningful um, pertaining to that was the last um, record that me and Sam and Dan did for Mapache is that we just agreed to not turn the computer on the whole time. I love it. Um, because when you record things 
on a computer, you can see them also. You can see the waveforms mm-hmm. and you can see oh. where they sit and where this comes in and where this comes out and where this is loud and where this is soft. And you can see all the tracks layered on top of each other. But when you're just using a tape machine, um, it's pretty cool to only have your ears as a tool. Um, and it also is um, a little bit limiting as far as how much you can, um, you know, move stuff around and, um, you know, you can punch in real simple fixes. Like if someone totally flubbed and played the wrong bass note, if you're skilled, you can go click, click and play the right bass note and fix tiny little things. But the stuff that's really important, like a, um, like a, a vocal take that sounds, you know, like it came from your heart and you can't like, cut you know cut and paste all these little pieces together you just got to do it and and it it keeps you from uh from getting well you either can't be too precious with it or you spend a bazillion dollars or something but you can't keep too much stuff it's like either after a while you can do so many takes and then you say like all right what what do you want from this do you want it to be perfect or do you want to record what we're doing (sighs) um and and so, I mean, you know, we, we, you gotta really be, well we got to get you writing a book, man. This is unbelievable. I mean, <laughs> I mean, is it is it peculiar to you? I I wonder. I mean, it, something that makes you guys a legendary group of cats is I think that everybody generally feels that way, uh, to one degree or the other. But I'm, uh, it is. I, I guess it wouldn't make it so unique and cool if every if a majority of people felt the way we did. But I know we are in the minority. Is that puzzling to you? Because it just seems like well, it's weird. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone agrees that like the fucked up piano on Highway 61 is the <laughs> sickest sounding piano, but no one wants to play a fucked up piano. Or like everyone agrees that the guitars on you know like the Velvet Underground records sound badass as hell but everyone wants their guitars to be tuned or you know everyone knows that like the way the vocals blend on working man's dead is it sounds the best it sounds like wood or something you know it sounds so natural (laughs) right but you know everyone is also really precious about um you know all their vocal takes and the blends and um it is a little puzzling i don't know i mean everybody Everybody does it. Everybody trips out if you if you make enough recordings, and you know it's easy to get uh, to, it's easy to get spun out. We all have to check each other for sure. But yeah, I agree. I mean, it's like you know we all so many musicians agree that this sounds the best. But you know, I don't know. It's, it's no. tough when it's puzzling. I guess I don't want to come at it like I'm. No, I mean it's just it has it you know it's 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 something new, that like newer music or whatever. But yeah, I'm also like perplexed about the idea of like why something that you know is so sterile is so so commercially viable in our society now. You know where you you know enhance it to a point when it's not even yeah. what it was, and somehow that's making money or the lack of authenticity i think leads also into now again that could be the key to this new enlightenment period is if we become more discerning about authenticity not just in music but in everything and are able to detect truth from falsehood and to have that courage i mean um and i guess thinking about it now that's probably why a lot of bands wind up doing records of live shows so that they can get out of the studio and sort of have that feeling and that liberation of, uh, of not being, you know, controlled or dictated by technology. Um, you know, before I let you hit the waves, I I just, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted to play this one more name, that voice. I don't, I don't expect you to know who it is, but it's pretty heavy thing. So, um, take a listen to it and we'll come back. All right. Protecting yourself, you know, uh, was when my mom had a nervous breakdown. When my little sister died uh, at the age of six, and I was eight, Hmm. and it traumatized my mom so bad that she uh, had a nervous breakdown. 
and they had to take her to a hospital uh, after the funeral. And that was the last time I saw my mom for uh, for quite a while, uh, several months. And at the age of eight, to be separated from your mom, you know, uh, at the time, I, I didn't know those things, but as, you know, later on you grow up, you realize, oh, my God, yeah, uh, that's why this and that's why that is the way it is. Uh, but I was um, shipped down to uh, Vivian, Louisiana, down in the swamps to live with my uh, my uh, my Aunt Connie and my Uncle Albert, wow. who, who was in charge of an oil tank right in the middle of the swamps in Vivian. And um, and after dinner every night, I would tell my, I would ask, well, I asked my uncle one time, I said, which way is Tulsa? And he said, it's, it's that way. So I went, I went out in the back of the house, and I uh, faced toward Tulsa. And I, I didn't want anybody to hear me, so I kind of whispered, Mom, Mother, Mama. And... Uh, and it's only now that I can tell that story without breaking down, because it was a big deal for me. It was uh, all my life coming up remembering that. You know, that was I didn't realize it was it was a kid, it was an eight-year-old boy being separated from his mom, and the last time he saw her, they were she was being carried out of this place by my dad and two of my uncles, and uh, so. It was very traumatic. Anyway, I think that that's where this little protection started. For exactly. Myself, you know, yeah. Being absolutely being, being separated from separated from either my mom, God forbid, or or, or separated from my even my my little sister, who they forced me to look at in the uh, casket, and uh, and I said after that that I would never ever go to a funeral again. And of course, I had to change that, but uh, <laughs> but it it uh, it messed me up for for many years. I I cried constantly for years uh, at seeing my little sister in the casket like that. So um, I just want to ask know, you a question. I did did could you talk about? You want to take a guess as who that is, brother? Is that JJ Kale? That's a great guess because uh he's from tulsa or he's from yeah he's from tulsa that was that was my fourth interview with jim keltner oh wow and then he goes on to talk about um being in louisiana with his uncle and the stove exploded and it it blew off his uncle's face and then i mean dude i was when he told me that i mean clay a lot of people think that like you know that the stuff I put up, I know you're not on new media, but you know, that, that, you know, these, these stories are from, you know, cutting and pasting from this and that it's like everything yeah. that I've done is I, I, I've taken it in auditorily, you know, like you said, years, you know, and like to yeah. know that someone like, I mean, this was one of the most powerful stories in the world. And to know that what Keltner said to me after he's like, Jake, thank you for being my, uh, for my for, for being my shrink you know i really appreciate that you know and and uh hmm. and i you know i i guess i just you know i i i've always been in p positions in my life too i think everybody has faced adversity and hardship you know it could be physical pain it could be the loss or the mourning of a relationship it, it could be you know it, the the death of a loved one but um I just, I guess I just wanted you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, your concept of love and ultimately how you um, continue on your own, even in the midst of insanity. And sometimes it just seems like, you know, the ship is teetering away or, you know, you're aggravated over something, you know, how you try to affect change in your world the bottom line is that keltner had a that was a huge trauma and then he went to los angeles and he broke out in hives and he couldn't play bass sports anymore and eventually he found the drums and he changed <laughs> a lot of american music but there was serious trauma and i think that in our world today that it, if you don't dig deep i mean that's the point is that you sam you guys scroll you know scrap and claw you find the 
you want to find the authentic stuff. I mean, you want to find the, the, the stuff that feels good. But at a superficial level, a lot of cats will think, oh, man, it's just everybody just, you know, that person walks on water. They've never had a problem in their lives. And I just think that everybody is suffering. Everybody is in their own madness. And even our late great buddy Neil Casal, I mean, for him to say there's, a, there's many ways to live life, but, but ultimately, you know, it was, he got into a dark space and he didn't think he could get out of it. And he made a, uh, a very, um, he made it, the decision that he made. And I just, my whole thing is that as we move along, because like you said, nothing will, it, we are in a new normal now. Um, like, I just want you to talk to your peers about not advice, but how you continue to affect positive change in your world and how that, um, impacts the dharma and the karma that that you have uh in your in your life yeah well i mean certainly i i think we're we're not of much help to anybody unless um you know we're taking care of ourselves um and so you know there's a lot of things that I try to do just to, uh, keep myself, you know, available, uh, to the, to where I am, you know, to the, to the present moment or, um, you know, there are, there's, there are things that we can do to, to make ourselves more present and, and, you know, in turn more available for everybody else too. And, um, can you give it, can you give an example? Well, having some sort of practice, um, some sort of meditation practice, I think is, um, pretty huge for me. Um, and, and for me having some, some sort of, um, some sort of like spiritual food or, you know, some reading or, um, you know, some sort of podcast or something to, uh, you know, keep, keep the fire going a little bit, um, with, with all that is really important. And, um, just trying to, there's just so much, um, distraction in the world that we live in. You know, it's hard to, if you want to, you could never have a, a moment where you have to really stop and think you right. know you, right you know you, at the bus stop or on the toilet or right before the second you fall asleep or while you eat um you know you can always be uh you know with our phones and and whatnot you can, it's really easy to um keep yourself you know a little bit half asleep um i think you know there's so much um, technology being developed for like the outside world uh, that we're at this place of kind of extreme unbalance uh, wh- where the technology for, you know, the inside world is seems like it's just barely keeping up. No, no we're know? not. You, no, we're not keeping up. I mean, it's, it's so far the technology has, gone so far beyond the evolution of the human. So that's where the disparity is. And it's really beautiful stuff, you know, it's sure. I mean, it's, yeah, and, right. and, you know, going deep down into the ocean and all these, you know, all these incredible things that we're doing and discovering about, you know, the outside world. But, um, you know, I think, you know, if we're still, we're, we're doing all these incredible things, but at the same time, you know, all these horrific things are happening and there's, you know, like you were saying, there's a little bit of a feeling of insanity or, you know, mania to the world. Mania. Um, and I don't know, I don't have, you know, too much of an answer for it, but, uh, you know, I can speak for myself that, you know, there, there are a lot of little things that we can do for ourselves. And if we can do those things and that makes us, 
you know, um, more available for other people. And that's, you know, I think kind of how it works um, as far as creating some sort of healing for the world. What is your, um, I remember seeing you, uh, I have a great video of, uh, <clears throat> at the house of blues in new Orleans, uh, when, uh, Neely came on stage and, and played with grateful shred. And, and I, I, your, your, your body language, uh, is you're just so fired up that he's out there <laughs> with you guys. And, um, and that was just a great, um, moment. I just like, what is it? that you hang on to about Neely, um, that you, uh, that you carry on with you, uh, in your life. Um, because, you know, he was, um, he was, you know, I mean, I, I just, the reason he was so great is cause he was just an accessible dude. He's just a, a really classic yeah. person. He wasn't like someone <laughs> I didn't, you know, I didn't idolize him. I wasn't in fear of him. I just, he always had the time and he always made you feel like you were contributing. And I wish there were more. I, mean, I think that's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the things that made the, a huge impression on me is uh, when me and Sam for Mapache um, opened some circles around the sun shows. I was there. Uh, yeah. Neil would, um, you know, we would, they would sound check first, get there early and set up load in sound check and then um and then we would load in and sound check and he would sit there and watch the whole sound check that's uh, awesome dude. which is pretty unreal i mean <laughs> you know that for you know someone who works as hard as, as that guy did and i mean for anybody when you after being on a tour and 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 loading in and sound checking uh you know you you want to go chill out. You want to go like have a beer and like look at your phone and sit on a couch and turn off your brain or something, or, you know, at least take a walk or read a book or smoke a cigarette or something. But, um, it's, it's, it's a long day and it just meant so much. And it's just said so much about him that he would just like, he was, you know, had so much love for music and, and it wasn't like he was doing some sort of like, oh, I'm gracing you with my presence. No, no, I guarantee you, he probably he was, dude, something. he was there to get inspired himself. I'm telling you, uh, he was just, you know, stoked, oh. and and he was, uh, you know, always down to pick up a guitar backstage and play some songs, which um, which is kind of oddly uh, hard to come by. I mean. You know, I haven't played with a whole lot of bands, but, um, you know, for totally understandable reasons, there's a lot of, a lot of musicians who, you know, before and after the show or whatever. And, you know, I certainly fall into this category a lot of the time, maybe more of the time where, you know, you just want to sort of chill out, uh, and right. maybe just like talk to a buddy or. Um, you know, just get focused for the gig or, uh, or sort of decompress afterward or something. But there's a couple special people and Neil maybe had it the most where, um, he was just like kind of always down to like, Oh, let's like sing some Graham Parsons songs or something <laughs> and, uh, or, or whatever, you know, and, uh, with anybody, you know, um, which was, which was really special and, and super inspiring. Just, you know, he had a, that to me was a a perspective that was just still like really fresh um you know no sort of like burnt out uh, you know tired sort of like just doing the gig it was like he was his his love for music was so strong it was really it, i think it's super inspiring well i mean the the it it also is like, I mean, it's like the audience after a show, you're like, you know, you want, you, I want you guys to play like an hour long encore, you know, but then the show's <laughs> over and then, and I often wonder, I'm like, boy, everybody's so amped up in the crowd. Like how do the musicians come down? And 
I feel like one of the best ways to come down is the way Neely would do it, where he'd just say, yo, let's just keep let's keep playing a little bit and then like wean ourselves off of it so that we can like yeah. have a more peaceful existence. Cause I think, and you know what? My only hope is that stories like what you just told people subconsciously <clears throat> or consciously that were maybe holding back from the, just the love of, perf- of creating. Um, those are the kinds of things that I hope will change when we can get back to a, a communal existence where, it becomes more of a folk folk kind of vibe where people are just horny to play and they just want to yeah. have fun together and they just want to build a community. I also think that that's, you know, I think it's great to, I love talking to the musicians, but I, you know, part of this whole thing about slowly coming back is like, what is the music without the community? It's, it's not, God, not, there's so many people I used to see like three times a week. Yeah. Just just because they were just <laughs> music lovers. Yeah, freaks, you know? dude. Just and, total freaks. Yeah. Yeah. And they're really special people and we have, you know, a close bond now, but I you know, I don't get to see them because, you know, otherwise our worlds don't inter- intersect. But there's so many people that I can't wait to like just run into a couple nights a week, you know. Uh, I mean just to just to just to see you in a space jam with with Horn and, and Lacrasto and, and Austin Beatty, that would make my year, dude. You know, I mean, I, I took that for granted. Me too. <laughs> I feel the exact same way. You know, man. I mean, can, before we go, uh, is there, can you, I'm just trying to, you know, my summer plans, I'm just, are there any gigs that you can promote or is, is, there, is there anything in the works? Maybe a Clay Finch band? I don't know, what, but what's going on? The only thing that we have set is, um, the the hypnic show the big sur yeah um, okay that's september that's event. september right yeah yeah that's the end of september um so hopefully that'll change i mean you know we got to be real careful still but it seems like the um it seems like things are changing pretty quickly with the public health so as soon as we can it, people are booking shows so if we can do it in a, a, a way that seems um, smart, then you know we're trying to get that going as soon as we can. I'd love to play. I'd love to play a lot sooner than September. Yeah, well, I um, mean, I, I I will say that like it's. Um, I just saw Billy Kreutzman put up that you know Dead and Company are going to be in Mexico January 2022. So I'm trying to keep my like. I'm thinking more along the line. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking like I mean regionally like what you guys did seems totally realistic felton right. uh, you know san luis Obispo, whatever you know santa barbara whatever it's like you're california based it makes sense that's realistic we you have know? the advantage of being small of you know right play smaller shows it's, it's gonna I, sadly it will take i think it's gonna take longer to get you know well i mean just, just the, the idea of, together, of you guys you know? doing flagstaff phoenix tucson it just seems like that's a, a little while away you know yeah, but you know, I just all I'm saying is keep me in the loop, and because uh, I I, sure I, I really just even if I have to keep so you know distance, I I, I it's been very <laughs> it's been hard, man. On a on a uh, you know I know just for me, I think one of the reasons I I was just so um, driven to do what I did the last few years was because I recognized that outside of like psychotherapy or mental therapy like you could get healed from dis-ease through the vibration of music and it's not the way i ever took music in before uh i often took it in in a very sedentary way so like the idea that that has been stripped away from me um has put me in a a bit now i'm in kind of a fog so i don't want to rush out there and i mean it's got to be worth my while but i just feel like yeah you know, it's coming, uh, but if anything pops up, you know, keep me in the loop, man, and I hope uh, I hope there's some swell in the ocean for you today, and uh, and just rock out, man. It's, 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 I can't wait to hang. I can't wait. It's going to be really good to see you, Jake. Much love to you, Clay, and the family, and uh, yeah, man, let's be in touch. Be cool, man. Right on. Take care. I'll talk to you soon. Real soon, bud. Peace. Peace. Yeah. legendary character clay finch um from a myriad of different bands dan horn band recently on tour and 
Northern California and Central Coast. And we're hoping to get uh, everybody back on the bandstand sooner than later. Um, And we will continue on. That's it for the Jake Feinberg Show. And we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.